The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. I, I'm sure everybody is, uh, hasn't seen each other in a couple of weeks due to the storm, and uh, <laughs> glad everyone is re reconnecting. A as we all know, two weeks ago, our city and a region were hit by the devastation of Hurricane Sandy. It's been a long two weeks for New Yorkers, but we here at Abney have never felt more confident about the future of our great city. We are resilient, and these experiences will only make us help create a better and stronger New York. Everyone in this room understands the enormity of the hurricane that hit our area. And many of us have seen, seen the damage firsthand. We have given our time, money, and goods to help those in need and to support our region's uh, relief efforts. The rebuilding process has only just begun, and there is no doubt that it will last for weeks, months, and years to come. But we will rebuild, and New York will come back better and stronger than ever. In these difficult and trying times, we do what New Yorkers always do. We come to help together to help our neighbors. The outpouring of support has been remarkable. Organizations like the Mayor's Fund, the Governor's Empire State Relief Fund, the Robin Hood Foundation, Red Cross, UJA, United Way, New York Cares, New York Says Thank You Foundation, and many, many others have accepted donations and will use the funds they collect to support the recovery. Philanthropy New York, a community of 290 New York-based foundations, is working closely with local Sandy-related charities and government entities to coordinate their response and ensuring that the efforts are not duplicated and that so all hurricane victims get the help that they need. ABNY has been active, uh, actively working with the city, the state, and the federal government and other organizations to get the word out about how we can, what we can do to help. The Abney Foundation has committed $100,000 to support the relief efforts, and we have provided information on your seats this morning, as well as on our website, about how you can give your time, money, and energy to help those in need. We thank you in advance for all your help, and thank you for all the people who have already helped. I want to pay a, a, a special shout out to our first responders uh, along with the city and state agencies and federal agencies that have worked around the clock <laughs> to keep our city up and running. We're joined this morning uh, and honored to have them here this morning with us is Fire Commissioner Sal Cassano. MTA, well, just why don't you hold, 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 hold the applause. MTA Chair uh, and Executive Director Joe Loda. ES, go ahead then. <laughs> ESDC uh, President Ken Adams and EDC President Seth Pinsky. Thank you for keeping our city safe, clean, and running during this difficult times. We're also a very honored to have with us elected officials uh, with us this morning. And we thank everyone from Washington to Albany and City Hall that have helped in this relief effort. Speaker Quinn, we're honored that you chose Abney this morning uh, and for your forum to discuss uh, the impact of Sandy and what it means for the future of our city. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our Speaker of the City Council, Christine Quinn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Back in early October, when we scheduled today's breakfast, 
I wouldn't have guessed, and neither would any of you, that I'd be standing here after the largest and most destructive hurricane in our lifetime, talking about how to protect New York from rising tides and future storms. But the world changed two weeks ago when Hurricane Sandy carved a path of terrible carnage across our city and most of the tri-state area. It was a storm that hit our most vulnerable residents the hardest, seniors, New Yorkers with disabilities, families living in public housing. This devastation is shared by our neighbors in New Jersey, Long Island, and Connecticut. More than 100 lives have been lost including 43 right here in our five boroughs. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers find themselves homeless, along with countless more who remain without heat or power or access to food, gasoline, or other basic supplies. But as we've seen time and time again, New Yorkers respond to catastrophe with an outpouring of courage and community. Our first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, sanitation workers, the men and women who restored our power and cleaned our roads, those who kept clean water flowing and got our trains and buses up and running, teachers, principals, custodians, doctors, nurses, folks at our hospitals, home care workers, the tens of thousands of volunteers who spent weeks working, working hard to distribute supplies or helping families to rebuild their homes and start to rebuild their lives. Our city's business leaders, you've been generous in your donations to the clause, including many folks in this room. The Rudin family and members of Abney have already given $1.1 million to the Mayor's Fund. And I know... And for anyone who still wants to give, there are handouts on each of your tables, chairs, about how you can donate to the Mayor's Fund, the Governor's Fund, and other charities. I'm so grateful to so many of my colleagues in government for their incredible efforts. President Obama, Senators Schumer and Gillibrand, Governor Cuomo, and Governors Christie and Malloy, Mayor Bloomberg, all of our borough presidents, our congressional delegation, our state senators and assembly members, but especially my colleagues in the city council. I've visited with New Yorkers in affected neighborhoods, and I've seen countless examples of their generosity and resolve. At PS 188 on the Lower East Side, where water rose up into the school, I met the custodial team led by Gary O'Neill. From Sunday to Wednesday, before and during the storm, the custodial team slept at the school. They spent every waking moment working to keep water from getting in, cleaning up and digging out to make sure school was ready so children could start to learn. Then there are the little things that make a big difference and make people smile. I was in Red Hook, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there was a jazz band playing music for the folks who were online at Visitation Church to get their supplies from Catholic Charities. And in Breezy Point, as I toured storm damage with Senator Schumer, we passed a man who was standing amongst the burnt out rubble of what, what was once his home. The minute he saw us, he yelled, hey Quinn, you better get me my building permits quick. <laughs> there was no question he was going to rebuild. No chance he was leaving. In fact, as he said, he couldn't get started soon enough. That's the spirit of New York. Selfless, tireless, relentless, and yes, a little bit pushy. Today, I want to talk about how to harness that spirit so we can rise from the destruction and take bold action in the days ahead because that is what this moment calls for. Not words, but actions. Two weeks ago, we were reminded that our city is vulnerable to the forces of nature. 
that the reality of climate change puts our homes and our families at risk. What we do in this moment, it will determine whether we de let that reality define us, whether we let it hold us back, or we use it to inspire us, to push us to do what we know is hard. Today, I want to discuss some of the ways we use the opportunity of this moment to invest in the kind of infrastructure that can protect our city from severe storms and to strengthen our city itself, our buildings, our energy, our sewer systems, our mass transit, our gasoline distribution, to make us less vulnerable to the next storm that will inevitably strike in the future. We must focus on the future even as we continue with the task at hand. And that task is significant, getting displaced people into appropriate temporary housing, restoring service to everyone in every neighborhood, helping New Yorkers repair their homes and rebuild their businesses. And we will learn from Sandy, so when the next storm hits, we'll be better prepared. In the coming months, there must be necessary debate about the city's response to Sandy. While that isn't the focus of my remarks today, it's a conversation that we must have as a city, one we have already begun to have. That's why I'm announcing here today that the council will be holding a series of hearings in the weeks and months ahead on everything from public safety to health care, and yes, on Con Edison's handling of the storm. I've spent the last two weeks working with New Yorkers who were devastated by Sandy. And it's heartbreaking to hear people to say, I feel like we've been forgotten. Help came too late. Well, I can promise you this. We're not leaving until everything is fixed, until every neighborhood is back on its feet. We've established satellite speaker's offices in all effective part, affected parts of the city. We're working with local council members and community leaders to help coordinate relief efforts and respond to problems as they come up. Because through it all, we are one city. When Coney Island is hurting, every New Yorker is hurting. When the south shore of Staten Island is paralyzed, none of us can truly move on. We rise together or not at all. And every neighborhood in the five boroughs touches lives beyond its borders. They've all impacted generations of New Yorkers in thousands of different ways. My grandfather came over from Ireland on a boat with nothing more than a third grade education. And he worked his way up through the ranks of the fire department. Rockaway offered him a chance to rent a bungalow by the ocean, to have what the rich people had, the people he saw in the magazines. It was his piece of the American dream. I can remember walking along that boardwalk with my late mother and aunt. It's one of my favorite memories of my mother, of how much that place meant to her and to our whole family. And last week, when I was in Rockaway, I saw that boardwalk lying in pieces, tossed into street corners, or crashed into people's homes. Millions of New Yorkers have stories just like mine. We'll make sure our grandchildren and their children have those stories too. Not of a Rockaway destroyed, but of a Rockaway reborn. But recovering from Sandy is just the beginning of the work ahead. This storm was a wake-up call. Those who still deny the reality of climate change, I challenge you, come to Coney Island, come to Far Rockaway, come to the south shore of Staten Island. Look in the eyes of New Yorkers who lost loved ones, who lost their homes and their businesses. Tell them that the science is inconclusive. Tell them that global warming is a myth. Our nation needs to take on climate change. And New York has already been leading the way. The mayor in particular, through Plan YC and his C40 initiative, has set the environmental standard by which all cities are judged. 
The Council has passed landmark legislation to reduce our carbon footprint, including the Climate Protection Act, which requires the city to reduce its carbon emissions by 30 percent by 2030. Nonprofits and forward-thinking groups like the Rockefeller Foundation have made serious investments in greening our city and preparing for the challenges of global warming. If we can get more cities to follow our lead, it'll make a real dent in the problem. But make no mistake, if we're going to get serious about climate change, we need the federal government and every nation in the world to wake up and take action. Yet we also need to face the hard reality that this trend will not and cannot be reversed overnight, or even in a few decades. If we cut the world's carbon emission in half tomorrow, the tides would continue to rise. In the last 100 years, New York Harbor has already gone up 12 inches. According to the New York City Panel on Climate Change, sea levels are projected to increase roughly one to two feet by 2050 and three to four feet by 2080. So if we don't act now, when our children are raising their families, flooding will be even more common in parts of Coney Island and Rockaway, Red Hook and the South Shore, City Island and Lower Manhattan. And places that never had to worry about serious flooding will suddenly find themselves vulnerable in major storms. And it's not just the next Sandy we need to worry about. Hurricanes of every size will continue to make their way further north. New York's geography makes us even more susceptible to flooding than other East Coast cities. The right angle formed by our harbor, known as the New York Bight, takes the waters kicked up by a storm and funnels them towards our city, and then blocks them from going back out to sea. Now, our geography is our geography. There's no way to prevent this. There is one idea. We could move Long Island. <laughs> We're pricing it out. I think it's going to be too costly, but we'll get back to you. So, clearly, we're not going to move Long Island, and we need to strengthen our infrastructure to prepare us for the effects of climate change, particularly as we rebuild in the areas devastated by Sandy. And as we rebuild, we must rebuild smarter. We'll need to address all of the many challenges posed by climate change, but today, I want to focus on two of the most pressing. One, how do we prevent or reduce the flooding we will face in the decades ahead? And two, how do we safeguard our critical infrastructure, our energy, our fuel, sewers, transit systems, homes, businesses, healthcare facilities, so that when flooding does occur, it causes only minimal damage? This is the single most important infrastructure challenge of our time. How do we prevent flooding and how do we protect against it? We don't need to look that hard to find good ideas. In the Netherlands, they've spent billions of dollars on miles and miles of connected barricades, like dams and dikes, walls and levees. In more recent decades, they added massive storm surge barriers at critical locations. The largest one, which has a really, really long, unpronounceable Dutch name with a lot of uh, consonants in it, it stretches five and a half miles from end to end. Now, this name thing, just so you know, if you asked me in the council, we would have just called it the Ed Koch uh, barrier, but they didn't ask. In London, a series of 10 enormous steel gates protects the city from the powerful tides that sometimes rise up from the River Thames. Closer to home, engineers in Stanford, Connecticut, with the click of a mouse, brought a storm surge gate rising up from the water as Sandy approached. Meanwhile, Louisiana is spending $50 billion with the help of the federal government over the next 50 years on natural barriers, protecting and refurbishing wetlands, 
rebuilding small islands in the Gulf. Along with reconstructing levees, this is one of the most significant pieces of their post-Christrina response. For in years now, there's been a discussion, largely confined to academic circles, about whether these types of barriers could and would work for New York City. Would it be worth the potential of billions of dollars in investments? Would they be effective in shielding our most vulnerable neighborhoods? Well, the time for casual debate is over. It's now crystal clear that we need to build protective structures. This will include both hard infrastructure, like seawalls, bulkheads, or floodgates, and natural defenses, like sand dunes, wetlands, and embankments. And there are places where the best solution may be to raise the elevation of land above the floodplain. Today, I'm happy to announce that we're taking the first major steps in hardening our defenses against global warming and storm surges. At the Council's request, the City has agreed to accelerate two studies that will help us determine the specific risks faced by different parts of our city and the best techniques for protecting each area. And both of these studies will now be completed by April of 2013. At the same time, I've spoken to our senior senator, Chuck Schumer, and he'll be taking the lead on this in Congress, working with the Obama administration to get a study done by the Army Corps of Engineers on this matter. This study is an important and necessary step towards strengthening our defenses. The Army Corps has the expertise to determine exactly what we can and must build. And without their permits, we'll not be authorized to build a thing. The study will include a definitive analysis of whether storm surge barriers will be effective means of protecting New York City. And if such barriers are not viable or feasible, it will tell us what other tools are at our disposal, the tools we need to ensure that New York remains secure against rising seas and future storms, because something must be done. Let me clear, be clear, this is no longer an academic exercise. This will produce a concrete blueprint for action, along with the price tag for any and all of these projects. We begin today, but the work of building and strengthening our defenses will go on for years, if not decades. In the meantime, there are more immediate steps we can take so that when we do experience flooding, it doesn't incapacitate so much of our city. So we must also seize this moment to begin an aggressive, top-to-bottom storm-proofing of our city's infrastructure. This work will be hard, and it will be costly. I won't pretend to have all the solutions today, but we know where we need to begin. We need to strengthen our energy infrastructure. Major storms will always bring interruptions in service, but Sandy knocked out power to more than 800,000 homes and businesses in New York City for days or weeks. Many still don't have power. Today, I'm demanding that Con Edison and all local utility companies take a series of significant actions to prevent lengthy outages in the future. First, we need to improve the protocols for when Con Ed cuts power to vulnerable substations. If they'd shut off power at the 14th Street station sooner, they would have avoided the explosion that caused long-term blackouts for hundreds of thousands of customers in Lower Manhattan. That, in turn, would have freed up staff to work in the rest of the city and get other New Yorkers' lights and power back on quicker. Second, all utility companies need to erect structures around power plants and substations in at-risk areas to protect them from storm surges of at least 20 feet. And they should review their standards regularly based on the most recent climate science. Third, they need to take immediate steps to flood-proof vulnerable infrastructure, like upgrading transformers, 
installing flood switches that protect the grid from damage. Cod Edison actually, to its credit, has a plan to do much of this flood proofing. But many projects aren't scheduled to be completed until 2017, and we simply can't afford to wait that long. And now that we know flooding can be much more widespread, companies need to dramatically expand the area in which those upgrades are being made. Fourth, there are a number of neighborhoods, particularly in Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx, where overhead power lines seem to come down every time we have heavy winds. I'm proposing that New York City require utility wires in parts of these neighborhoods to be buried underground, where they'll be better protected, just as they are in most parts of the city. And I want to send a clear message to Con Edison today. We will not tolerate you simply passing the costs of this on to ratepayers. New Yorkers cannot be asked to pay more just to receive consistent and uninterrupted service. Finally, I'm proud to announce a significant action that will reduce the chance of a storm knocking out cell phone coverage across the city. This will help ensure that New Yorkers in distress can make emergency calls and find where their loved ones are. In the aftermath of Sandy, AT&T and T-Mobile entered into an agreement to provide access on their networks to customers of both companies in the impacted areas. At our request, they've agreed to make this emergency network sharing agreement permanent. And we urge other wireless providers to follow their example so more New Yorkers can get in touch with emergency services and their families in times of crisis. This means that even when a network go goes down, customers can place calls just like they normally would, and their calls will be carried by whichever network is most operational in their area. This will go a long way towards preventing loss of service, and I want to thank AT&T and T-Mobile for their leadership. Now, Sandy didn't just wreak havoc on our electrical system. It also devastated our ability to access gasoline whether for communities or for emergency vehicles. In the last two weeks, we've seen as much as six-hour waits at the pumps and volunteers unable to reach hard-hit areas due to the lack of fuel. This storm caused major systemic breakdowns at almost every phase of the gasoline supply chain. Our regional refineries in central Jersey shut down for days because of flooding and power outages. Serious damage to Port Newark and Port Elizabeth prevented shipments of gas coming in from outside the area. Local storage facilities were operating on backup generators and couldn't push out gas at anywhere near the peak capacity. And even if they could, in some cases it wouldn't have gotten them very far because their pipeline system had lost power too. What little gas did make it to the city still couldn't get into your tank at times because gas stations didn't have the power to operate their pumps. Today, we're sending a letter to the United States Department of Energy, formally requesting an investigation of the breakdown in our gas distribution network. And I'm demanding that the oil companies work with federal regulators and local leaders on a major overhaul of the entire system. We need to storm-proof critical systems at refineries and storage facilities to protect them from flooding and to provide much more backup power when the lights go out. We need to build in greater redundancy so that if the supply chain is compromised, fuel can still get where it's needed. And big oil companies, they need to do much more to support their local stations. Three days after Sandy hit, Less than a quarter of the service stations operating under international companies like ExxonMobil, BP, and Shell were selling gasoline. Meanwhile, as many as three quarters of our regional chains like Hess, Wawa, and Sunoco were up and running. They were using backup generators that the parent companies had provided them. 
Exxon, BP, and Shell are multi-billion dollar companies. The least they can do is provide support to the small business owners that sell their products to drivers around the world. I'm calling on every oil company to secure backup generators to keep pumps operating and to create a system for deploying them to gas stations in an emergency. As we strengthen our city's infrastructure, we must also focus on our city's sewer system, much of it which remains woefully outdated. The Department of Environmental Protection has been making major improvements, including almost $3 billion this fiscal year alone. But there are still great challenges in working with an old system. Our Finance Committee Chair, Dominic M. Reckia, Jr., he represents Coney Island, and he was out helping his uh, constituents during the storm when he got a frantic call from his wife. The city had been forced to shut down some sewer pipelines because we couldn't process all the flood water fast enough. As a result, the whole system backed up, and sewage was coming out of Dominic's drains in his sink and in his bathtub. Now, this is an extreme example, but sewage overflows that pollute our waterways remain far too common. Residents and business owners who have to deal with sewer backups have had enough. So our plan today includes accelerating major sewer and wastewater treatment projects to make sure they can stand up both to major storms like Sandy and to more common flooding. Electrical equipment and other critical systems need to be elevated at treatment plants in flood zones. We had pumping stations fail during Sandy, and they need to be upgraded and protected from storm surges. We need to speed up our efforts to improve our sewers themselves and install soft infrastructure that helps absorb water runoff, like green streets, green roofs, and blue belts. And we're going to pass legislation requiring the city to use new pavement materials that absorbs water, rainwater and prevents sewer overflow. Now, not all of these steps will be able to process the water from a 14-foot surge, but they will all make the system more resilient to the kind of flooding we'll see from continued climate change. Now, even in places where the system worked well, there is still room for investment and improvement. Joe Loda, who's here with us today, and the MTA, they did a remarkable job maintaining and restoring service. Joe, thank you and everyone who works with you, the MTA. But there are steps we can still take to protect our subways from the flooding we face, not just during a hurricane, but practically every time it rains hard. There are small steps we can take today, like installing raised buffers around subway grates in certain areas. This will help prevent water from seeping in or elevating the entrances to our stations a couple of feet above ground. Then there are new technologies to explore and study, like industrial balloons that could completely seal off subways or tunnels from flooding. At the same time, we must continue to invest in more resilient forms of transportation. Our buses and ferries were up and running little more than 24 hours after the storm had passed. They're also more flexible. You can reroute a bus a lot, more easy, a lot more easy than you can a train. Some of the money we invest in storm-proofing our city needs to go to these and other transit projects. We can't allow severe weather to incapacitate 8 million New Yorkers. Now, when we talk about upgrading our infrastructure, we don't mean just power or transit. We also mean rethinking the way we build neighborhoods that were destroyed by the storm. Our building code includes requirements on how to floodproof critical equipment and how to avoid major structural damage. But if we learned one thing from Sandy, it's that many of our buildings are still vulnerable to storms. It's time to consider stricter requirements 
for flood-proofing boilers, generators, and electrical equipment. Our water, or, or things like water systems that use sensor-based technologies that can keep water running during a power outage. We may need to raise buildings higher above base flood elevation. And we need to consider expanding these requirements to include new areas that will be more vulnerable to flooding in the years ahead. So at our request, the city's Building Resilience Task Force, led by the Urban Green Council, working with the Real Estate Board of New York, has agreed to hold emergency sessions. They'll help us determine the best ways to build smart without putting unnecessary burden on individual property owners. In every case, we'll assess environmental impacts and make sure our efforts don't have unintended consequences. We'll need to determine which costs are the responsibility of private entities and what should be paid for by the city, the state, or the federal government. Because many of the things I've proposed today are clearly big ticket items. If we decide to build a storm surge barrier, it could cost roughly $16 billion alone. The sum total of everything I've described here today could reach $20 billion. But just look at the response to Hurricane Katrina. It gives us some sense of the scope of federal investment that must follow a storm this destructive. Congress authorized more than $110 billion in spending to the Gulf Coast, including over $25 billion to the city of New Orleans. Now, Sandy was a different storm than Katrina, but to people in many of our neighborhoods, it was just as devastating. And just to put things in perspective, there are 360,000 people living in New Orleans. We have nearly half a million residents in Staten Island alone. We need the federal government to invest in New York's citizens, to help us build New York safer than before. And even if we need to take on some costs locally or turn to the private sector for investment, think about this. New York City suffered an estimated $26 billion in economic damage and losses. That doesn't even take into account the losses we'll suffer if we don't rebuild correctly. If businesses flee our city because they think Lower Manhattan is too risky a place to invest. Even half that money used properly goes miles towards creating protective barriers, strengthening our energy grid, or flood-proofing people's homes. If all we focus on is the cost of rebuilding and not preparing for the next storm, the future cost to all of us will be staggering. Our greatest danger is inaction. We stand in a unique moment that carries with it a unique opportunity. The future of our planet the world our grandchildren inherit depends on what we do in the months and years ahead. At this moment, the need for action cannot be ignored. The cost of this enterprise cannot be dismissed as too great. It won't be easy, and it won't come cheap. But New York's history is a story of progress of making smart investments when others were too afraid to, and continually adapting to changing times. We're a city that built skyscrapers where swamps once stood, and that spirit defines us today. We are right now transforming what was the world's largest garbage dump into a sprawling park where our children can play. We grow vegetables on roofs. We turn abandoned railroad tracks into open space, forgotten factories into high-tech hubs. And where we once saw a gaping hole that marked our darkest hour, we now see a tower reaching to the heavens that will soon stand as the largest building in our nation and as a symbol to our strength and our resolve. 
There is no task too great for the people of New York City. They are ready to act. We in government must be ready to lead. We will seize this moment. We will harness the energy and generosity we have seen in the weeks since the storm. And working together as one city, we will rise from this devastation stronger and more united than ever before. Thank you all. All right, let's see the question. Oh, you got you got the you got the curtain call. Sit down. Well, Chris, you can see by the reaction, uh, Abney is here to work with you and fulfilling the vision that you've just laid out. I think it's comprehensive and uh, addresses many, many of the issues that uh, many of the people in this room and outside the room in the business, civic, uh, phil philanthropic world have been thinking about, uh, even you know, pre-Sandy, pre but now I think we all agree that we need to accelerate and focus on the really important infrastructure uh, developments that will uh, help protect our city and grow our city. But how do we pay for this? I mean, how do we, how do we you know, you, you came up with some ideas. Do you have any more specific thoughts on how, how, we, how we fund this? Um, now, look, the, what we talked about and, and how do you pay it is exactly the right next question because it's $20 billion, you know, maybe a little less, maybe more than that. Um, now, let's understand this. Clearly, New York City is the most important city in this nation, the financial capital of the world. It is always the role of the federal government to help cities rebuild after storms and big projects like this around environmental issues are always the role of the federal government. You overlay on that, that if New York City loses its stature and position as the financial capital of the world, that isn't just a devastating thing for us, it's a devastating thing for the country. So let me be clear, we need the federal government. Our job as New Yorkers is to articulate what we need, to advocate for it, to push it, to say we're ready to do it. That's what we're starting here today. The storm surge barrier that I talked about in Stamford, Connecticut, it was designed, built, and is run by the Army Corps of Engineers. It was paid 70% by the Army Corps, 25% by the state of Connecticut, 5% by the city of Stamford. That is the traditional split, but I bet we can do better with the 100% request we have on the table right now. Look at the response to Katrina, and appropriately so. Almost all of that money is coming from the federal government. This is a moment where we need to say to Washington, we have sent you tax dollar after tax dollar after tax dollar. We never get as much back as we send. We need it now, and we are prepared to spend it correctly and effectively. I'm going to open up to questions, but I, I forgot to introduce the uh, a newly elected state senator, Brad Heilman, is here. Brad, where are you? Thank you. Congratulations. I think also Tish James and Mark Weffer. I, I, I did, I did oh, introduce okay. them. So uh, questions from the, from the audience? I hope, uh, I'm sure there's no, this is not a shy, shy group. Feel no obligation. Barbara. I'm reluctant to ask this question, but will some of these measures in case of a terrorist attack also help in emergency situations? Um, and, and I think uh, all of this, I think we've all had that thought in our heads during the aftermath of Sandy. Where is the overlap? What can we be learn? What can be learned from this hurricane that can also be relevant to that? Certainly, issues of communication and how we can stay in touch with each other. We saw that. We, uh, we know that's important as it relates to uh, acts of terrorism as well. Doing everything we can to secure our energy system, keep our gas system running be as supportive of our mass transit system. I think it all is connected, because what is one of the things that often is targeted in terrorist situations are critical infrastructure, because there is the belief that that will disable a, a jurisdiction, a city, an area. So the degree to which we're protecting those against the elements and doing it in a post 9-11 context, we're adding greater protection for ourselves as well. 
I mean, I, I think there's also, it's an economic, uh, there's, there's an economic engine for this, yep. uh, for, the, for our city and state and region. I'm looking over here, I see uh, Building Congress and uh, other, other organizations that their men and women, are, whether the architects, the engineers, and actual construction companies, the workers, these men and women are going to be the ones building these infrastructures and, 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 and reinforcing our city. So it's going to be a, the lemon into lemonades and having a tremendous uh, economic stimulus uh, to, to our city. So uh, th there, is, there is a positive sign uh, to, to all of this. Um, if there are no more questions, young, young lady over there. Would you be floating some bonds, you know, like years ago when things were bad and there were dormitory bonds, all kinds of things like that that might be helpful people who would buy them? I mean, that's certainly something to talk to, to the federal government about, you know, to see if that's a way to be helpful. Sure, of course. I mean, again, the strength of New York, we have the financial capital right. uh, leaders here, and I'm sure there will be, you know, whether it's liberty bonds that were done after 9-11 uh, and other, you know, other type of financing mechanisms, public-private partnerships to help finance uh, the, these projects. Jeff? Speaker Quinn, I'm Jeff Barnett from New York says thank you. Um, we went to the Gulf Coast 28 times for you, but I'm saying that this is Katrina-level destruction and infrastructure breakdown often. I know you've had a lot on your plate. Have you had the chance to think about what's the one key lesson we could take from the recovery of Katrina and apply here? Um, first of all, I just want to, Jeff, stand up for a second. Jeff is uh, uh, a great, one of the, the heroes of the, the the Sandy recovery, and he is focusing right now with his volunteers on rebuilding the homes of first responders that have been destroyed in the storm. So, um, <laughs> if, if folks could make their way over to Jeff to support his efforts, I think that would be a great thing for all of us in the city. So, thank you very. And he's been doing it quietly, but we'll try to make sure it's less quiet now, which is a helpful thing. You know, I, I think. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot in these two weeks is how do we do a better job of communicating and coordinating, right? Because in some places, uh, it feels like there wasn't enough resources. And in some places, it feels like there were actually not as too many resources, but too many of not the right resources at one time. Now, some of that comes from great outpouring and generosity. And you don't want to squash down on that. But there needs to be a better way, even you know, in a big city where the destruction happened miles away at times from each other, of doing a better job of coordinating all of the different entities that are out there to get, because one of the things we saw clearly in Katrina is help didn't get there soon enough. We continue to hear that from New York City neighborhoods, but then also to see pictures of clothes on the street that aren't getting used. How do we put ourselves in literally physical positions as to, uh, guessing or, or, or being most informed about where the destruction will be so we can have ourselves and our assets safe but roll out most quickly to get the quickest on the ground sense to then have a pre-existing network in place that we can funnel the emergency volunteers more comprehensively so when we get to a place of capacity in one neighborhood we don't overflow and then people are discouraged and move them quickly to the next place. Because one of the things that I think is a, has been a challenge about this storm is that the devastation is not concentrated in one neighborhood. It's spread out. So we need to have a better way of being in communication, coordinating, assessing quickly, and also being in place sooner and earlier. Chris, thank you for uh, your, your, uh, your visionary remarks, and we look forward to working with you. A apropos to uh, the discussion about infrastructure, we have on Thursday uh, the CEO of AT&T, Randall Stephenson, who will, Stevenson, who will be talking about uh, Sandy uh, uh, recovery efforts and long-term uh, infrastructure uh, uh, planning. So thank you all. We'll see you Thursday morning. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for coming this morning. Picture? Here we go. Okay. That was great. Oh, thank you. I'm Grant Greenberg, and you're looking at Lower Manhattan, one of the world's most beautiful and recognizable skylines, yet it may all end up underwater. That's ahead on Science and You.
Professor Nicholas Koch teaches Earth and Environmental Science at Queens College. He's also a world-renowned expert on hurricanes and says New York City is bound to be hit hard. The frequency is low, but the consequences are extreme. There are several reasons why a hurricane could wreak havoc on the city. One is simple geography. This right angle makes the New York area one of the most dangerous places in America for a hurricane to come in based on the generation of flood surge. For a Category 3 hurricane, we get a Category 5 level surge. Professor Koch shows us artifacts from Hog Island that were washed away when the hurricane of 1893 destroyed the vacation spot that once sat off Far Rockaway. We know that if something has happened before, it's capable of happening again. If it hasn't happened in a long time, it's going to happen soon. Koch says consider the damage done by a Category 2 storm nearly 200 years ago. It would only be amplified now. In 1821, what is the population in New York? Tens of thousands, right? A hurricane Category 2 did tremendous destruction and raised the water level from low tide 13 and a half feet in one hour. And the Hudson met the East River for three hours. Manhattan was two islands. The hurricane's path isn't the only reason for increased storm surge. Sea level here in lower Manhattan is up a foot from a century ago and could rise another four to five feet in the next 50 years. You see, a lot of people don't understand when the Weather Channel says that we're going to have a storm surge of 15 feet, there's 30-foot waves on top of that surge. So as you raise the ocean, those waves are going to come in at a higher and higher level and do more and more damage to uh, higher structures. Gary Conte is on the lookout for hurricanes heading our way. He's the warning coordination meteorologist for the National Weather Service. New York City typically experiences impacts from a tropical storm about every five years and about every 17 years from a hurricane. Conti says ocean temperatures are rising. The heat serves as the engine that fuels the storms, potentially leading to fiercer and faster hurricanes. We are in the middle of what we call a multi-decadal cycle where the sea surface temperatures are averaging above normal and that typically correlates with more hurricanes than normal and more intense hurricanes than normal. It's like a three ring circus. Saltwater flooding, freshwater flooding, wind. The time for evacuation is half of what it is in Miami. In Miami, you can sit there, watch the Weather Channel, make a rum, a rum drink for four days and then evacuate, right? In New York City, you have six hours from Cape Hatteras. That could spell disaster for popular summer spots like Fire Island, leaving it much like Hog Island, a distant memory. To a geologist, a barrier island is a very temporary feature. Sea level is rising, and all the houses you see on Fire Island are going to be gone in 100 years. While levees and seawalls didn't do much to help people in New Orleans when the killer storm Katrina struck, experts agree storm barriers could be beneficial to the Big Apple. Manhattan is bedrock, bedrock that's 500 million years old, and it's the toughest rock in the world because three times it was squeezed between continental collisions. That's why we can build the height of the buildings we do in Manhattan. So when those walls go on the rock, they're there. Some building owners in susceptible areas like Lower Manhattan are putting up barriers, but don't expect to see a seawall up anytime soon. One thing's for sure though, areas that stay dry today may be wet tomorrow. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You.